Welcome back to Cult Radio A Go Go Live, and you are back on the air with Tiffany Defoe, and I have a very couple special of guests uh, for our next segment here. First of all, I'd like to let all of our listeners know that we are joined by one of our Cult Radio regulars. Uh, you know him as Russ Bucket. Everyone else in the real world knows him as Jeff Beeching, and Jeff is going to be my co-host for this interview. Jeff, uh, you're there with me, right? Yes, I am. Thanks for asking me to do this. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. And our featured interview guests for this evening, we actually have uh, two for the price of one. Now, one of our guests, you know her, you love her. She has become an icon of the sexual revolution. You may know her as Madam X. You may know her as the Happy Hooker. Or you may simply know her as the name that everyone knows her by, Miss Xaviera Hollander. Are you there? Yes, of course, I'm here, all the way from Holland, yeah. Yes, all the way from Holland. And joining us also on the line, we have the director and co-writer of a brand new documentary, well, pretty new, that came out on Xaviera called uh, Xaviera Hollander, The Happy Hooker, Portrait of a Sexual Revolutionary. Mr. Robert Dunlap is also with us. Robert and Xaviera, welcome to the show to both of you. Hi there, thank you. Thanks yes. for asking us. So I kind of wanted to start out by talking about uh, the documentary. Now, from my understanding, the documentary came out in 2008. It has been well-received by multiple film festivals. So, and, and both of you can kind of take turns ask, answering this, but Robert, why did you decide to do this documentary? And Xaviera, with all of your renown and books and everything that have, has come out, why did you decide that it would be a good thing to kind of wrap it all up in one documentary. I'll let so Robert and Robert Harris start with that. Go ahead, Dexie. Okay, well, uh, Robert's wife or partner, uh, Pat, Dr. Patty Britton, a well-known sexologist in New York at the time when I met her, happens to be family of mine, direct family from my father's side. So it's amazing that there are two penologists or sexologists in one family. Uh, she moved to California and uh, I kept, I was allowed back in the States at that time, not too often yet, uh, just got there once or twice. And she introduced me to Robert Dunlap, who was at that time a paleontologist. I had to even think of what is a paleontologist. So when he explained it to me, he said, well, I, I love animals, I can, I'm a filmmaker, and I can shoot any kind of animals. So we got to talk about me coming back to the States, uh, being sponsored, I think, by Larry King at that time, and uh, so after an absence of 28 years, this would be quite a return. And then we got to talk about, wouldn't it be fun if somebody would make a movie about this? And then Robert said, hey, man, if I can shoot monkeys or animals, I can shoot people <laughs> too. And that's how we got the idea of actually really filming the, the official return of me after 28 years of absence. And that's how now Robert can pick up from there. <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> so we did shoot a lot of animals, but not the kind that you would think. <laughs> uh, and so actually this uh, uh, began in uh, 2002, and uh, uh, obviously I had uh, followed Xavier over to Amsterdam, where I was able to do interviews with uh, family, friends. I was able to go in to this wonderful archive collection of photos of her family from years gone by, and then uh, we went to New York for the uh, uh, the 30th uh, anniversary of the Happy Hooker book. Mm -hmm. So I was able to follow her around on the book tour. So during the book tour uh, in New York, we were able to interview a lot of uh, celebrities, friends, and people like that. Then we did it on the West Coast here in San Francisco, and then all the way to Los Angeles. And one of the really fascinating things that happened while we were doing the book tour in Los Angeles, there was a fellow who came up to me and he said, you know, I was in the concentration camp with Xavier. Wow. And I said, what? And he said, yes, and not only that, but I actually have and I own the rare footage of the concentration camp. So uh, with that uh, being said, I said, oh, my God, this has got to be in the documentary. And uh, so we proceeded to get this very, very exceptionally rare footage of the concentration camp that Xaviera was in with this fellow. 
Yeah. That's well, a, let me that's a, add to it because when you mentioned concentration camp, Americans basically think about probably Auschwitz or Dachau or the when we talk in Europe about concentration camp, this is more the Japanese the Japanese camps uh, in Indonesia, which was a former Dutch colony. And my father was a psychiatrist and a doctor there, had his own hospital, and so he was captured by the Japanese. And my mother got captured too, and I was barely three weeks old. In fact, I was a love child, because my father knew there was war on in Europe already. I was born in 43, and uh, yet she wanted a memento, a souvenir of, of my father. And he said, no, you must be crazy. You don't want to do that. We'll be separated soon. And indeed, three weeks later, we got separated. And uh, I wrote a, how it all started, Robert, you know, that is, I wrote a book called Child No More, mm -hmm. which I promised my mother to write at her deathbed. So it's the first book I've ever written, which is not dealing with sex, uh, but <laughs> therefore it doesn't sell so well because people think any book carrying Xavier Hollander's name has to be a pornographic book. But this was a very emotional, an ode to my mother, and uh, covered everything from way before I, I was alive. And at that time when I wrote the book, I was in a lesbian relationship with Dia, who you know, Robert, who was in the film yeah. briefly. And uh, she said, because she read all my chapters, she helped me edit it, and she said, listen, you've written seven chapters about your parents meeting in Indonesia in the camps, but you got to be born, you know. I said, this book is not about me, it's, it's about my parents. But then I put myself in the picture as well. <laughs> Literally and figuratively, so you, make it, you made a picture of it as well. <laughs> Well, I was, you know, I got to see the documentary this morning, and, um, it, and I was surprised. First off, I was taken how touching it is. It's, I mean, it, from the very start, I mean, you, as you just said, three weeks in, and, and you're in this concentration camp for three years. And I also didn't realize that that footage, you know, because you get kind of used to that kind of thing being stock footage, but that's amazing that that was the actual footage used that, from, from there. That was, that was incredible. But, um, yeah. like I said, I noticed how touching it was. Uh, did that, Recounting all this in the documentary, did it really open up any kind of wounds for you, Xavier? I mean, this is this is really some of this was really heady stuff. Well, I, my memory does go back to about the age of two and a half, you know. And usually, and, and my father was a psychiatrist, so he he tried to analyze me and hypnotize me. Okay, I was I couldn't cry till the age of twelve, I think. I was bedwetting myself at that age at top twelve, and then my father said. Had to have a serious talk with his daughter, and he said, "Every time you don't pee in your bed, you get 25 cents a quarter." So I, my probably was my Jewish mind, instantly if I make sure of that, <laughs> instantly I stopped peeing in my bed. But I didn't stop me with the nightmares of the sounds and the horrors of, of the Japanese camps. You know? So even till today, I can handle any kind of cruel YouTube films or films in general. But if I hear Japanese. Uh, in a movie, Scream. I remember Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, I think, with Sakamoto, sure. when the Japanese soldier or, or big shot started screaming. I cringe, you know, I really, I can burst into tears. So I do remember certain things like sounds, of course, and I will never set foot in Japan, but I don't mind Japanese food lately. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me ask you, uh, that kind of brings up a, a good point. Having come from the the background that you do, Xavier, and, and knowing that you had that part of your childhood that was very traumatic, most people that you would talk to that had gone through something like that would grow up to be a very shy, closed-off adult. So was there something else that had happened in your life that kind of formed you into the very open and honest person that you are and, and how did you go from kind of the shy and intrepid child to being the very outwardly and, and, and proud woman that you became to be? Well, one thing is I couldn't cry till the age of 12 because nobody would dry my tears. When my mother got beaten up, and if you read the book, and I mentioned the story in the film, to such a degree that everybody in, in the camp where I was with the women and the children thought that she was dead, including me. For three weeks, I was uh, a motherless child. And I could cry what I want, but nobody had time or, or energy to, to, to... It's my little niece of, of five years old. I was two or three who fed me snails and, and dog scraps of food and, and potato peels that kept me alive. But uh, in that period, I remember sitting behind the fence and seeing those Japanese uh, soldiers marching by, 
screaming and I was crying and nobody came to dry my tears and only it took a psychiatrist or child psychologist to, to rebirth me to get me to learn how to cry because it's a, it's a very a very important act of life you know you've got to be able to let and now I can cry but basically I cry about very emotional bits in a film or a, a, touch, a, a touchy scene I see or, or a piece of music uh, I don't or I cry out of anger sometimes a powerlessness in a way but for years I couldn't cry. So lo- I was always a lonely child because I had no brothers, no sisters. Well, I had a stepsister, but she's from my father's first marriage. I met her again for the first time in 40 years last year in South Africa. But I grew up alone, and there were not many kids around either after the war. So uh, I was always what you call in German an Einzelgänger. I, 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 but I was always keeping busy. My mother was used to call it, oh, she's got syncitis dance. Now they call it ADHD. I kept every moment of the day, I kept busy doing something, drooling or, or playing things or making up stories. Or I had a very vivid fantasy. It was a good storyteller. My mother was a great storyteller, too. So uh, then I, I knew one thing. I don't want to be a follower. I was not a follower. I always wanted to be the leader of the pack. And in fact, I gave a lecture for a work uh, for an organization called 4045 from the war in 1945 in Holland. And they deal with people that have war traumas. And they asked me more or less the same question. You say, like, how come you grew up so well adjusted and, and like a leader rather than a suffering, pining boy? And it turns out that one out of ten people that have had the horrors of concentration turn out like me. They, they wanted to be number one. I became the best secretary of Holland. I wanted to prove myself to my father and my parents. And then I wrote a best-selling book. And now I'm running an inc- extremely well-run, uh, smooth, bohemian-style bed and breakfast. I'm well known as a theater producer, too. I'm always reinventing myself. And Robert knows this. I'm always changing, you know, or I'm collecting erotic art, which people don't buy at the moment anymore. But I'm always changing it to something like a, like a chameleon, almost. Mm-hmm. And successful. Well, and, and when you talk about in the documentary, you talk about one of the things you brought up just now was the Secretary of the Year. And I thought that was really cool. Um, do you remember... When you won that, did you think that that was going to be the way your life was just going to lead? Or did you see yourself as, okay, I've accomplished this this thing, now I need to move on to the next challenge and kind of step up to different things? Yeah, well, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I did. Uh, when I won the award, which was for manpower, the temporary agency of manpower, uh, they immediately afterwards invited me to become what you call a unit head. I then started working for the company. I, I got paid twice nothing, you know. But it was a lot of fun. And it was a Christian effect, very much like the Happy Hooker days. It was then the banker who would call me, Miss Holland, do you have a typist for me? She has to do shorthand in three languages. Uh, and I would, it's a question of question and offer. And later, as a happy hooker, as a madam, it was the same kind of bank. who would say, Miss Hollander, have you got a redhead for me? It was big boobs. Or so. <laughs> so it was all, it was, it was offer and, 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 uh, you know, question and offer, a demand. So it basically, it didn't matter what I was selling, apples or pears or hookers or, or now clients who come, they bring their, it used to be I sold beds and bumps and now I sell beds without bumps. People bring their own parts <laughs> usually. So I'm still basically after 50 years in the same business, but, but still doing with beds. In fact, I bought a beautiful new astronaut bed myself with my husband. In fact, I'm married and there's nobody believes that. And I'm faithfully married too, to a lovely, lovely man 10 years younger than me. I never thought of ever getting married again, but uh, it did happen. <laughs> Well, kind of going in with with that and talking about nobody believes that uh, you're married, and, and you know people obviously have a preconceived notion of who you are or what kind of a person you are. And Robert, I guess this question would more be directed towards you, and, and yeah. that is, were you? Did you have any? Maybe not because you possibly knew her beforehand, but did you have any preconceived notions of of what type of a life or what type of a person Xaviera was and were you at all worried about doing a documentary on someone knowing that you're based in the U.S. that had, uh, shall we say, was quote-unquote asked to leave the U.S. politely as Xaviera was? 
No, not at all. Not in the slightest. In fact, when I realized when we first had met together, we were at a party, and I found her to be so charming and so, uh, how can I say, her honesty about every little detail in life is what really is a huge attractant. And from the, the get-go, I thought, I really don't care. I think this is really important material. And the more that I got into it, the more that I uh, spoke with her about her past, the more I realized, you know, this whole thing about being the hooker was only uh, really about between a three- and a four-year period of her life. Mm -hmm. And then she moved on to being the great writer, the great uh, uh, theater um, uh, entrepreneur, uh, the, the great bed and breakfast, and uh, the great art collector. So that was only one small factor and faction of her life. And I thought, no, that doesn't bother me in the slightest. And also, while I was making the film, ironically, because uh, my uh, partner in life is Dr. Patty Britton, a clinical sexologist, at that same time that I was producing the film so that I could do really good research uh, in the past and put everything on the timeline, what was happening uh, in this period of time that Xaviera came out with the book when she was a madam in New York and all, it really became important that I also, I received my Ph.D. in clinical sexology from the Institute in San Francisco. So uh, it was kind of, everything converged so beautifully. And it's like Xaviera said, our lives, because we're like really family, is kind of like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. Whenever there's that one missing piece, you don't worry about it. All of a sudden it shows up. And there's a wonderful story that uh, Xavier called me all excited and said, you know, I got a call from a relative in South Africa who found all of these wonderful pictures of me as a little girl. Uh, can we use them in the film? And I said, absolutely. And she said, well, that's just how my life is. That one last piece, as well as for the book, Kintoff or Child No More, she needed that one correct picture with her and her family. And all of a sudden, the next day, she got the phone call from the relative saying, I have this wonderful picture of the three of you. So if that's, that's just how things have uh, worked out with both the documentary and, uh, I would say, our relationship uh, in the family. Right. Well, Xavier, let me ask you, kind of going off of what Robert just said and pointing out the fact that you know, uh, being a madam and, and being, quote-unquote, the happy hooker was only, like, you know, three, four, five years of your life. Not and even that much, no, even less, two years, actually, more, two, two and a half. But the blitz career, you may call it, yeah. Okay, well, everybody has kind of, I mean, that has, of course, become the thing that you are most known for, you know, and, and everybody has credited you with ushering in the sexual revolution and breaking down so many barriers. How do you feel about kind of carrying that title and having that image, even though you have such a career of so many other things that you've conquered? Well, it's, uh, it's never bothered me. I know well, what it did bother was my ex-husband. I remember being in Canada, in Vancouver, just scooping a bite of spaghetti bolognese, which is a bit difficult to maneuver anyway, and some fan, absolute crazed fan, who had been watching me, staring at me, comes up to me with a napkin. and said, how long did I have your autograph? And I was almost prepared to put my spoon down. I say, yes. My husband, or my dead husband, said, no way. You know, don't you, uh, don't we have any privacy? No, he said, she's public domain. And I remember Jackie Kennedy once said this too. She said, "You become public domain. You become part of part of the audience, you know, of, of the people." Now, uh, Barbara Streisand would wipe off her uh, fans. So she could be very rude to them, and she did not, did not have a good reputation as being a kind-hearted star. And I liked the publicity. I've always liked it. And doesn't matter where, uh, you know, it's, it's, as long as they spell your name right. Now, you know what's amazing about The Happy Hooker, because that book has come out in 71. In the beginning, people said, well, I read your book, right? But 20 years later, say one generation further, I'd meet a younger person, and he'd say, or she would say, well, you know, I found your book at my parents' bedside table. <laughs> and now, 40, 45 years later, <laughs> I meet young people that say, you know, when my grandma died, 
and my grandpa had to move out to an old age home, we had to clear the attic, and there I found your book <laughs> all under the dust in a, in a bookcase. So, I mean, I think with my book, with my fame, I've conquered two generations, and I'm still feeling youthful, and I still manage to marry a man who's 10 years younger and makes me feel young, too. And age is really, you know, I think when I was 25, I thought 65 was old. I'm now 67, and I'm still I'm working harder than ever to survive, you know. Now it's a matter of surviving. Then it was just a matter of luxury. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's fun to keep busy. You know? I don't think... Uh, I'd, I'd love to die after I've produced a show and we get a massive standing ovation somewhere and standing in front of my crowd. That would be fantastic. Like, wasn't this this comedian Cooper who died on stage and they didn't even know if he was dead or a part of the act? So right. I'd like to die in the saddle somehow. <laughs> <laughs> That's There's awesome. There's a funny story, too, when I was actually doing an interview uh, because the film has been uh, really traveling around the world. I did a, uh, an interview with someone in Bulgaria, and the, the person said, do you know that I learned English by reading The Happy Hooker? <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't know that. That's the story. I'm sure yeah. they learned some very interesting words, too. <laughs> oh, they sure did. <laughs> oh, that's totally about words. You know, I, 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 okay, I'll give you a story. I did the Tom Snyder show, the Tomorrow Show it was called, and it was filmed in Paris, and I was very famous, and I was pushing 40. So, And I had just fallen in love with another big love of my life, and he was sitting in, in, in the studio because they were taping it there so it could be sent out to Canada uh, or to America where I couldn't go at the time. So he said, well, Miss Holmer, how old are you now? I said, well, I'm going to be 40 soon. He said, oh, my God, no American woman would ever say that she's reaching 40. She'd say, I'm in the twilight of my 30s. <laughs> he said, well, what do you like to do most? Are you in love? I said, yes, there's my lover. And I said, I love this famous four-letter word that ends in K and stands for intercourse. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, put the children to bed. This is an adult program. And I said, sir, this is the word talk, you know, verbal intercourse. And he cracked up. He said, okay, let them listen. So, and then somebody said, you can actually talk about sex like as if you're buying a, a dress at Bonnet Teller or Bloomingdale's, you know. So you, you don't have to be coarse to write uh, erotic stuff or to talk about erotic things. I just like to mention the beastly things by the real names sometimes. You know? I don't know why we always had to talk about flagellation or cunnilingus, you know, because it sounded good, but nobody uses those words. So right. that's what I did. I, I broke the taboo, like Lenny Bruce used to do, when he'd say, you know, nigga, 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 fuck, fuck, fuck. You know, I'm just saying this, I'm just quoting him. And people got numbed by it. Right. And I did that in a way with my erotic books, I believe, of which I wrote well, 18 in the meantime. Well, yeah, and I was going to ask you about the writing, because, I mean, you write beautifully, and you've written all types of different things. You've got, you know, from your books, and you've all, all, over 35 years of columns from, from Penthouse. Penthouse, yeah, right. And that's, I mean... Now, did you pick up the writing initially from your diaries when you wrote in your youth? Yeah, that I did. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you read the book very well. I, I, had, I had a diary, which my mother, indeed, as I, you can see in the movie, ripped to pieces and um, had, me, had me actually spanked by my father. I'm sure Robert has a little anecdote about that <laughs> in the film also. Yes. But, uh, you know, Robert, tell the story about the, the diary. Well, what and the happened spank. was, well, she, uh, her mother took the diary and literally, tore it all up and said now to uh, uh, Mick, her father, now you give her a good spanking. She's been writing all of these things in here, and those aren't right. So he put her on her uh, over his knee and spanked her. But during the spanking, she realized that she was uh, having an orgasm because <laughs> that's one of the, the things that, uh, you know, was happening with this connection between her and her father. Mm -hmm. And she started shrieking, oh, oh, oh about uh, uh, having the orgasm, and her mother said, stop it, stop it, Mick. And uh, her father realized, no, she's in the middle of an orgasm, so he just started <laughs> spanking her softer and softer and more slowly so that she could have the orgasm, and then they hugged each other, and, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> she never forgave me for that. She never forgave me for that. But, I'm sure. Uh, now, that's when I realized that pain and pleasure 
uh, that's another subject in my book also, not so much in the movie, uh, go, can go together. Sadomasochism is not a matter of going to a kinky fetish party with high heels and not knowing anything about Sacher or Masoch, you know, anything about the history of it, but that it could be a gesture. It's, it's, it's a game between two people that love each other and respect each other, but also feel that they need the, the punishment or the, the giving out the punishment. So that's why I said I'm never a follower. I'm a leader, you know. And, and so one journalist in Mexico once said to me, well, Ms. Hollander, do you follow any religion? And I said, hmm, no, you know, uh, I've had 17 million people reading my books. I like the color of purple. And if I got a good designer, he'd make me beautiful kaftan. I think I could start my own religion. <laughs> and so much for my being humble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, uh, Xavier, and then Robert, you can kind of give me uh, your opinion of how it played into the documentary or if it had any influence at all. But, of course, uh, Xavier, you know that there was uh, three Happy Hooker films done in the U.S. The first one was actually based on your novel, and that was the one that starred Lynn Redgrave. Um, and then yeah. the other two were kind of works of fiction that was loosely based off of the concept from your novel. Um, what did you think of the different films? And am I right in understanding that you did have some involvement, uh, at least in the sense of the first one being uh, based on the novel, and, and what did you think of Lynn Redgrave's interpretation of you? Poor girl, she's dead now also. Uh, right. Lynn Redgrave's dead, Robin Moore is dead, the only one left is Yvonne Dunleavy, my co-author. Uh, well, what I think of it, it's, uh, she came to me after she did the movie, and uh, I was surprised that she amazingly well had imitated, well, she was a good actress basically, had imitated my accent, my slightly Dutch accent. Mm -hmm. And um, but what I didn't like is that she had as much a sex appeal as a toothpick as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. So she was doing a strip, an anti-strip party where she gets from being nude, she takes her clothes off, puts her clothes on, and she does a scene of my book reading all the things about the stock market. I didn't find it very sexy. The entire film, every time it got a bit sexy, they cut to the next scene. So you could either take your grandmother or your grandchild to this movie. <laughs> but uh, it was what we're doing now, and this is amazing, and Robert knows this. We've now finished uh, an Australian film uh, uh, songwriter, composer, and an English songwriter. We finished a musical called The Happy Hooker. <clears throat> and I think together with the documentary, and my books, we could make a hell of a nice package. And when I go to New York, in fact, April 1st, I'm coming there for 10 days with my husband, uh, Yvonne Dunleavy, who is my co-author, the only one alive still, is doing a fundraising, an angel party, is, is, uh, is getting some people together. And it so happens the composer is there as well, and he's going to break, uh, break the news with five songs or six songs, bring the girl and his keyboard, and we're trying to get finances to get to hit Broadway, hopefully within a year or two. So that's the next item I'd like to talk to you on the next show in a year. Or so Absolutely. you can call me again. Well, how but meanwhile, what I what I basically do in Amsterdam is living a bit of my fame. You know, people know me from worldwide, all over, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole house breathes eroticism. You know that, Robert. You've seen that in the movie yeah. also. Sometimes a client comes down, say, from Italy, a husband, wife, and child, a son of 12, 14, let's say, for, and they walk in, and they've been driving, they're exhausted, and the husband looks around, he loves all those erotic paintings. It's never shocking, but it's erotic. And an hour later, the woman and the husband and the child go down the stairs, schlepping their suitcase again on the way out. I say, what's happening, what's happening? Que pasa? Well, there's too much pura pornografia here. They found it too pornographic. And then a month later, the husband emails me or calls me, I'm coming with my mistress. Put back the pornography. I said, I never took the pornography off, but you can come with your mistress. I prefer that. So, I mean, my reputation carries me through till in my 80s probably. <laughs> I don't mind. It's fun. May, look at Mamie Van Doren. I've been talking to her on the phone. She is pushing 80. Yes. And her photographer has actually made some beautiful pictures, which Robert also has in the film. And he showed me the visiting card, and he said, this is Mamie Van Doren. I said, wow, she looks like 45. Mm -hmm. I said, if you can make me, who is a few years younger, they said, look like 35, I'll be glad. And so he did. So who needs a plastic surgeon if you have a good photoshopper? That's right. We actually had uh, Mamie on our show at the beginning of the year, and, and, and she is just fabulous. She's a legend. She's remarkable. Uh, 
and that that's kind of an interesting uh, talking point, and maybe I can ask you about this, Robert. I mean, it, it is a very um, how shall I say? Uh, it, it's a very kind of shallow type of industry to be known as a sex symbol because there is. In, in Hollywood, anyway, a, a life expectancy on it. You know, sex symbols are pretty much known to go out fast and furious in a blaze of glory. Yet people like Mamie Van Doren and Xaviera are, are, you know, older in years, and they're still lasting sex symbols. Uh, why do you think that is? Why do you think that people like Xaviera are the exception to the rule? Because they absolutely connect with people. And another one that we should include in the same uh, conversation would be Marilyn Monroe. Yes. Now, Marilyn Monroe, people who really knew her well, realized this is a very intelligent woman, or she wouldn't have ended up with uh, Arthur Miller. Right. Absolutely. So I, I think in... in well, Marilyn Monroe dies very young. She did. She never a role, but yes. Mae West, for instance. Wait a minute, Mae West was the opposite. She stopped, she started hiding when she hit, I think, 53, and she hated getting old. She really hated it. You know, she was hiding it. And Greta Garbo had, had the same. But Mamie Van Dora is very outgoing. She could be my sister almost. You know, when I'm her age, I don't think I want all those things fixed. But she was absolutely high age, even quite natural. She only started getting facelifts at 72, I think. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, I've never had anything done to I, people. Say, you say, "Oh, you're so beautiful." When I look at my old portraits on the wall, I say, "Yeah, but now I look great from the neck up, or maybe from the <laughs> chin up." You know, uh, <laughs> you never know. But well, what now, you Anna, see is what you get, Zaviera. Well, and I wanted to ask you about that because you you do have a you have a, a personality that just comes off the screen, and it shows in this Probably. documentary. And you also you, you only did a few films though. You did My Pleasure Is My Business, which was supposed loosely based on on your life, and then yeah. you, I guess you did a oh, small yeah. film. I guess you did a small film in Transit. But other than that, why didn't you act anymore? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm always a better director. As I said, I'm, I'm a madam. I'm, I'm a leader. I, I don't want to be standing in front of cameras and having idiot words to remember. I'm not very good at memory, memorizing lines. So I did two years of acting school in Toronto with a fellow called Eli Rill, the Stanislavski theory, you know, how to cry, how to laugh. How to... I know a little bit about all that, but uh, I'd rather write a cabaret, you know, and, and do one or two little sketches, but I don't really want to be in front of, 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 of the podium. I'd rather just you know, be the one that presents the good stuff. That's why I'm producing theater. I go every year for 30 years to the Edinburgh Theatre Festival, and I handpick uh, one man or one woman shows, or maybe two people, but I can afford my budget. But each play that I've brought to Holland, or now to Spain in my home theater, has to ring a bell, has to strike an emotional chord in me. I just did a play about the Westerbork Serenade, which is a very, very heavy concentration camp on the way to Auschwitz. And I had the greatest trouble uh, sort of penetrating the, the Jewish people with their, with their war traumas and saying, Yes, you must see this play because this is where your parents or your grandparents uh, were, were sent to the camps, right, to the destruction camps. And they, they cried and they, they refused to go, but eventually they went. And they had a wonderful, it made him give an idea what, what really took place there. And now I'm bringing, for instance, shows of Sholem Aleichem. Uh, so happens to be Jewish writers and Jewish performers. Maybe it's because my father was Jewish, but I have this thing about Jewish plays. They're, they're, they're more emotional, maybe. They're, I'd love to have Woody Allen <laughs> do something <laughs> if I can afford him. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it, I'm an animal, a theater animal, even though I lose my shirt sometimes. But <sighs> I still try to bring, now I'm doing a show in, in Spain about a stripper, you know, a, a life of a stripper. When I saw her in Edinburgh, a beautiful young girl, I thought this is like the happy hooker. This woman works for six months as a stripper. And uh, the, the, the bullshit she had to put up with and how she got corrupted and how they, they tried to make her really bad and, and, and dishonest. And eventually she came out a winner again. But it was kind of sad and happy at the same time. I, I like, that's why I like the mask of the clown, you know, with a tear in one eye and a smile on the other one. Mm -hmm. The mask of the theater. Absolutely. So, well, and you also, I mean, I guess not only with the theater, I mean, you also are a benefactor for other people, for writing and photography and, and painting. That You must get a huge amount of satisfaction from that, from starting people off. Is, is it, Am I right in assuming that? 
Yeah, but uh, unfortunately nowadays, I live in Amsterdam, and uh, some people say, well, what, do you consider yourself rich? Now, rich, no way am I rich anymore. But rich to me is could be a precious moment, you know, uh, rich in emotions. But a lot of my friends in, in Holland or, or everywhere in the world almost are, are losing it, you know, like uh, they just, they can be very talented, but they don't get appreciated. Or if they're painters, I just bought a beautiful painting from an artist who's got a lot of talent. He doesn't know how to sell himself. Uh, I know people that write magnificent books and they don't have a proper agent. You can't do anything on your own anymore in this world. You have to have uh, a wagon or, or uh, you know, a, a friends who don't cheat on you, who don't rip you off for big percentages or cuts. And it's very hard to do to be a solo performer, which I still am, except I have my wonderful husband helping me. Without him, you know, some people say he's my right hand. I say, no, he's more. He's like everything for me. But I also like to be able to stand on my own feet, and I still can do that once in a while, I think. But I'm very, very glad that I've, I've met my right partner. I don't think I would have the, en- the stamina or the energy to do what I did. That's, I had two heart attacks, and Robert knows that. I had two heart attacks after two massive theater plays I did, and right after the show was a great success, I ended up in the hospital. They called me the flower when I came back six months later. Oh, there she is again, the flower. I was the youngest of all the people there. And almost everybody that had suffered heart attacks was a noisy, busybody like me. So it was never a quiet word, I must say. (laughs) Well, Xavier, I wanted to ask you, uh, and and then we'll kind of get back on track, but... I had found something online when I was doing research, and I wanted to ask you if you were aware of it and what your opinion of it was. I guess there was, in uh, 1974, there was a hardcore adult uh, porn that was made called The Life and Times of Xavier Hollander. And it's a lot of people don't realize this because, of course, just by seeing the title, they would think you were in it. You weren't in it. You were actually, uh, there was a character called the Happy Hooker called by, uh, played by Samantha McLearn. Um, but were you aware of this adult feature? Have you ever seen it? Oh, no, I know, I know what you know. Well, I, years later, I found documents from my lawyer, who's dead now, Paul Sherman, one of the biggest prior cash from the Sherman law firms. I think I've finished half his office there with all my money I paid. But I found out that Robert Moore, who now is dead, God ever so, had made a deal with this company to, to use my name, like the happy hooker uh, goes to Hollywood and, 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 and California, whatever it was. Uh, it, it, I never signed for this. I never got a, a, a penny for it. And yet I have the decency, now this is the difference with Robert Moore, to make a contract with his widow, number five, of course, he's had five wives, and this is the fifth, his widow now, and she wasn't even around to, to give her a certain percentage if the musical takes off. I think that's only fair, because uh, it still has his name, and it's basically his name that made me big. Mm-hmm. But uh, if other people would be as honest as me, I'd be a bit richer. I wouldn't have to struggle so hard to, to survive nowadays, you know. I have a wonderful home here and an incredible beautiful villa in Spain, which Robert knows. And I now have to use my stones. I'm not talking about my diamonds. <laughs> they're, they're long gone. I now use my stones to, of my house to to make a living, like to, to rent the houses out, to, to do bed and breakfast. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just started bed and breakfast in Spain and Marbella as well. So if anybody looks me up on www.xavierahollander.com, They'll find out, uh, there'll be a lot of people and the name of Xavier Holland, but you find my website. And it, it produces the theater, it produces my books, it has a, it has a web shop, uh, the documentaries on it. <laughs> There's, I, I did a CD with songs of 20 years ago, naughty songs that I wrote and sang with a much higher voice. And all that, uh, it's, I call it the schnabel the bubble circuit, you know, and you, to stay alive you have to sell things. Whether it's a bicycle to a client or a tour along the red light district or uh, well, just something personalized. And, and, but that's, that, that's uh, like being a salesman in the market, I think. You have to stay alive, so you have to talk, you have to do your sales talk. And, and Robert, I don't know, Robert, you're doing all sorts of things too, right? It should be interesting yes. to find out what the producer of the film does too. Yes. So Robert, you want to give us yes, an, I'm here, an I'm update here. of uh, what you're doing now? 
Well, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, the film, I also have uh, developed an online school called Sex Coach U, and uh, we have online students now uh, all over the world: Singapore, Prague, uh, uh, the Netherlands. We have a student there now too, Xavier. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, England. It, it's really exciting in Belgium. So it's something that we've developed, and that's uh, when I got my Ph.D., uh, what I specialized in was sex education. Right. Well, let me kind of ask you, and and this would be uh, to kind of get the take of both of you on it. Um, it, It's kind of just a general question, but there was something that I had read that you, Xavier, had said, and that was, actually, I think I might have heard it on one of your albums. You had said that, as a as a madam, that you could separate and differentiate between sex and love, that they were two very different things. So let me kind of get your comments on it, and also as a as a sexologist, let me get your comments on it, Robert, because still in America, at least, uh, you know, there's always that tie that if you have sex, you have to be in love. But in other parts of the world, it's it's a very different concept of it. So what are your comments or opinions on that theory? Well, what, I, what I've noticed is by showing the film uh, around the world, we've had it uh, uh, on every continent from Australia uh, to South America, Sao Paulo Film Festival. We had it in uh Tel Aviv, actually, Xavier went to the film festival there. The rest of the world is so much more sophisticated than we are. And I'm really amazed. I recently was doing some interviews uh, in uh, Canada, and their questioning uh, always comes from a slightly different point of view, and that is sex is just for sex sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't have to have all of this embedded love and, and stuff in it, because sometimes that can ruin the sex. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I've found. Uh, sex is sometimes just for sex itself. Correct, Xavier? Well, yes. But in my little booklet, I wrote a cute little booklet, The Sex 69 Tips. Uh, how to become a better lover, based on the penthouse letters, actually. For 35 years, I wrote penthouse, call me madam. And uh, there's one little chapter, they're only about two pages long, and that's called the three clittery. Uh, in a woman, if she's a real woman, she will have a brain clit, a heart clit, and a pussy clit. And if you don't know how to stimulate the brain clit, and ultimately the heart clit, and finally the pussy clit, I don't think you get very far as far as having real fun in bed. If you just have a technical... Uh, sexual escapade, uh, it could be clinically right, but emotionally it leaves you with zilch, you know, it leaves you uh, empty-headed. Now, I used to be, as I was a hooker and had a lot of sex, the moment I would fall in love, I'm just reading that chapter about Skip, uh, and uh, I fell in love with this banker, this part of, the, of the, the musical, that's why I read it again, and I couldn't take his money anymore. My heart got in the way but of the sex for the sake of sex. So when you fall in love with a client, it, it's the end of your career. <laughs> What's a nice girl like you doing in a business like that? Right. And However, when I got out of the business and I came back to Holland, now listen, I've been in the, the, the business of having sex many, many, many times a week. I lost track, I lost counting. <laughs> Then I had the greatest problems for the next three, four years to emotionally bind myself to just one person. I couldn't be faithful. I couldn't. And now, mind you, I'm a bit older too, but I don't have that urge. Although the only urge I still have is I love women. I'm very bisexual, and my husband insists on me being faithful, so I will be. But I'm still surrounded by beautiful or sometimes older, but lesbian women, and I love the the the, the radiation of their you know the, the just being with them or hugging them or 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 just just the the the, 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 the emotional the, the relationship we have, and they also love Philip, my husband. They said, well, if every lesbian had had a man like him, she probably wouldn't, probably wouldn't have turned gay. You know, some some <laughs> woman just turn off men after a rotten bastard marriage they've had. You know. So I am blessed that I have a man who is not one of those macho assholes, so to say, but he's a <laughs> right. caring and considerate person. So I don't need to, to, to horse around anymore. 
Although I still have my fantasies, of course. <laughs> At least yeah. those nobody could take away from you. <laughs> well, now, and you talked about in the in the movie or in the documentary, you talk about in the the most common question you ever received was, "Am I normal?" Am but, I normal? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to kind of turn that around and ask you, what one piece of advice do people need to know that they don't seem to? Wait a minute. What do you, they need to know that they don't what? That they don't seem to know. That they should know. What one piece of advice do would you give somebody who need, the "I am normal" thing is a question that that would always come up. But what is the piece of advice you would give somebody who to to better their lives? What would you say to somebody to make their life in better, relation? Their sex okay. life? Right. Really, well, yeah. Well, it's not that difficult. It's that people often live with. They're fantasies, and I think you should keep things of fantasy. A lot of people try to live out their fantasies, and then they end up, end up empty-handed. Like masturbation. I, had a, I give stag parties here, or, or girl parties, you know, and I give, give workshops. And I ask all the women about, I just did one last week, what do you masturbate? When you masturbate, do you do it alone, or do it together, and what do you think of? Now, in my case... You, in your fantasy, you should be able to think of anything. I could think of the hair of Richard Gere or of, of the hand of a bicycle rider, but I seldom think of the actual sex. And when a man masturbates, uh, he doesn't want to do it with his woman. He wants to have his own fantasy. He doesn't want to think, am I pleasing her? Is she happy about it? Am I too fast? Am I? So you should leave your, your partner some degree of freedom. I'm, I'm not saying... He or she should horse around, but you should at least at least leave them free with their own fantasy and their own body if they want, and that is not really cheating. But some women get really annoyed when they find their husband masturbating over Playboy or Penthouse, or they even tell him, you know, <laughs> get rid of the subscription. So, uh, or uh, and I think you should leave each other a degree of freedom, respect each other, and also communicate better with each other. If your husband or your lover does something really wrong, like for instance, he goes to bed, he's unwashed, or he's got filthy fingernails, and he shoves it right up to your genitalia, then you shouldn't yell at him. You should take him, guide him into the shower, uh, take a big a piece of soap, and, and uh, foam him up, and, and have a bath together, a shower, and then make beautiful love without yelling and screaming. Like, you selfish bastard. So, a lot of people are powerless when they have problems. And they go to uh, the psychiatrist, or they end up uh, taking Prozac or, or, or tranquilizers, or whatever you people take in your country there. So uh, I think you could do a lot of solving of problems by communication. I think that's it. Talk, that famous four-letter word that stands for intercourse. Right. Well, I that's... Think that's that's an interesting question because that was something that I had, I had heard you say previously, Xavier, and I want to ask both of your opinions on this, is that, of course, uh, still, unfortunately, for whatever closed-minded reason, in, in the U.S., uh, prostitution is still taboo. It's still illegal in 49 out of 50 states. It's only legal in certain counties in Nevada. And about, yeah. Yeah, we've, all, oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> we've actually had uh, a couple of working girls from, uh, for example, one of them was from uh, Dennis Hoff's ranch. We had uh, Brooke Taylor on our show to talk about it. And a lot of times when we've had working girls on the show, they have said that in their opinion, they see having sex with these guys, these Johns that come in, they really kind of see it as therapy for the men because a lot of times men or women, women go to, to prostitutes as well, they'll come in and they'll have sexual hang-ups or, or they, you know, maybe got yelled at by their lover and, and that's not allowing them to be free in the bedroom. So what I would like to get from both of you is kind of your opinion on prostitution in present day and do you kind of see it as more of like an emotional therapy or is it just all about getting off physically? Well, one of the well, Robert, you say, I don't know how things are in America at the moment. You tell me, yeah. Robert. I was just going to add the, the one thing about the original question about normalcy in sexuality and just to quote uh, Kinsey, uh, there are no unnatural sex acts, only the ones you cannot perform. Oh, so that's an interesting said, one. Yeah. So oh, I thought it was that if both partners didn't agree, then it's abnormal. But if, yes. if you do agree, then it's, then it's normal. Is that, yes. Am I right there? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But how about the prostitution question, though? Yes. For, for my point of view, I, I don't see that uh, as a taboo. I think it's unfortunate that uh, in this day and age that we have to both stigmatize the people who are involved in uh, uh, this type of act. Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense because the rest of the world, what about the, the, the people, for example, in Switzerland who may have a handicap? Well, there are actual sex workers who are uh, trained in all kinds of what they call sensate focus, et cetera, et cetera, that go and take these that people. And surrogate wives. And surrogate wives, yes, correct. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Well, as we kind of wrap things up here, I do want to kind of give our listeners just a little bit of a teaser of some of the juicy stuff that they can uh, check out in the documentary. I have to ask this, you have to forgive me, because I am a pop culture fan, but I had heard, uh, I had seen in the teaser trailer for the documentary that there is some discussion about uh, Xaviera, one of your most famous clients, including Alfred Hitchcock. Is that true? Yeah, I am. I don't get it, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, he had a very macabre, that's not very sexy, but macabre wish. He flew me out, or oh, his assistant, so, uh, you never really get to see the man himself, uh, to California, and we had to go to a playground, and I had to pick up young girls, no hookers, absolutely no hookers, but they had to be young girls, in school outfits, you know, and then I had to guide them to a particular, like a morgue, you know, it was actually made like a morgue, with all the classical music or Bach, whatever, and, and the place had the flowers and purple curtains, and they were told to pick up an envelope each, which had $100, and uh, but they didn't know that. It was just go there, and then walked in, and there was Alfred Hitchcock laid up uh, in a basket, in a ca casket, yeah, casket, uh, beyond recognition, you know, of heavily powdered white face, and, of course, the top part of his uh, torso was open, Oh, I had like a, a glass or whatever, it, it was open, and the bottom was covered with the wood, and the girls would come close, and they had no idea who he was, because they were young enough not to know, and then he would suddenly, obviously he was masturbating, he'd raise his torso, and the girls would like, ah! and at that point, <laughs> they just, he got an orgasm, you know, and they ran off, and they took the envelope with him, and that's, that's how he got his job. Well, no wonder he made those crazy movies in those days. <laughs> so that was uh, one of the most interesting uh, characters I've ever come across. Not a very sexy one. <laughs> now, another one, a, a singer, you know, he, who did it his way, you all know who that is, of course. He liked uh, to have a whole floor of the Wall of Astoria service. You know, he had all his, his let's say, New Jersey friends over. And he made them all sign paternity suit contracts that nobody could could actually say, well, you know, uh, Jackie or Frankie or anybody had knocked me off and made me pregnant, like Charlie Chaplin did several times. He had to pay fortunes to young, young girls that got pregnant. So, and, and then he used to like to spank the girls. You know, like, come on, you're broad, move on, move your ass. Not a very fine person, I must say, as a client. So, but uh, there were some good ones and some bad ones. But I basically had a lot of fun in, in that whole business. It was, especially doing this musical now, it's like living it all over again. Or even doing the documentary. And, and Annie Sprinkle, perfect sample, you know, and she's in the movie. Did you see the who saw the, you both saw the movie? Yes. yes. Oh, I did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. But Annie Sprinkle, she said I was her icon, you know, and Veronica Vera, still a good friend of mine, she invented the term sexual, uh, what was it, the evolution. Yeah, it was evolution. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, and I was going to ask because that we've all remained hookers make the best friends. I tell you, hookers and lesbians, in my opinion, make much better friends than false married bitches who <laughs> try to steal your husband away. <laughs> well, I love that you you encourage people to write to your to your website on your website. You put your your email address on there, and do yeah, you I get really. do you get a lot of people coming to you for? Looking to be the next happy hooker, or, or at least getting into that profession. Yeah, there are dozens of them that, that that have also written some stories, and, and 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 sometimes the stories are pathetic and and amazing. But uh, often the time, I don't. I, I'm on Facebook, but I really haven't got time for it. And it's uh, when I put my events on there, I never got any bookings. I've never gotten rich from Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn. But I do like plain emailing. You know, people can just find my address on the website, and 
there's a good, the guest book as well. And I get a lot of thankful people that said, well, thanks to my book, they, they, uh, they became better lovers and they had wives that stopped complaining <laughs> in the beginning until they went to the hooker or, or read the book. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a, quite a good people pleaser, I think, and, and that's what I like to. When I die, I think I'll, I'll say something like, here lies Vera. She was an ultimate people pleaser. She lived a full life, you know. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that. <laughs> well, as we kind of close things out, uh, I wanted to direct this question to you, Robert, and this will be kind of like our last question here. Sure. For people that don't know Xaviera, and and let's say that they came to you and asked you, from knowing her personally, what is one or two things that you would tell somebody about Xaviera that – people don't know publicly about her. What, how would you describe her? And I know I'm putting you I on would, the spot. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's excellent. That's a great question. And I would say uh, quite simply, she is a survivor. She is someone who's been able to maximize whenever there's the uh, uh, an opportunity. She is the ultimate opportunist. She takes advantage of everything that comes her way as everything is 100%. There's no uh, 75% or anything like that. She lives life to the fullest and does everything that she possibly can 100% of the time. I've never met anyone like it. And I'm but sure... Doesn't opportunist sound a bit bad? Like somebody no, not who's... at all. And when I say an opportunist, you, you take the opportunity. You seize whatever opportunities, you know, come your way. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, that's a compliment, good. there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm also always at the right time and at the right place. As you said, the puzzle that falls to pieces. And uh, whenever I'm just starting to despair, because we all have our moment, suddenly the light, the, the sun comes out and the right person pops up in my life or the right phone call rings or uh, as a check in the mail or something like that, you know. So basically life has been very good to me. And to you too, Robert. I mean, you, you, you're... Yes. Except one story about your dog, I want to know quickly. He was very ill. He just had a dog that, that had a spine broken, was it? Oh. Yes, spine surgery. Uh, a very expensive operation, and she's still uh, paralyzed from the waist down, so only her front legs are moving currently. Uh, did she get run over? How did it happen? It, it happened by a very freak accident, just jumping into the car and hitting... Uh, just the, like where the gear shift uh, panel is. She just yeah. hit it funny, and it snapped her back. Mm. Oh. Anyway, sorry that we divert, but animals are, in fact, I, nobody asked me, do you have children? Last question. No, I don't have children. A, I couldn't have them because I had an ectopic pregnancy. B, when I look around me, I am so happy with my animals, and so is Robert. My animals, I've, animals, three dogs and, and, and two cats, Three cats and three dogs, they have never done me any harm. And I, I, the people that come to my bed and breakfast, they take it or leave it. Either they're allergic and they stay away, I mentioned on my website, animal friendly, or they love them. And uh, I'm all for animals. And I love this Mexican guy that gives all the, the horse, the dog whisperer, what's his name? He's your famous <laughs> guy, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Is, yes. He's out or so? Yes. He's coming to Holland too, you know, because I never, I'm never good at training dogs. I'm good at training men, but I've never been good at training dogs. <laughs> well, that's because we're a lot easier to train than dogs. Are. Yeah, right. And well, thank you for having me on. The stage production, the theater production of The Happy Hooker, I hope it, it goes off with flying success. And if you make it to yeah, Broadway, it will, we'll hopefully have to it will bring the, the movie back into the business and the, the documentary and everything. And, uh, okay, great. Okay, I'm going to throw in one quick plug that we're really proud of. It just happened. People can buy this uh, documentary now on iTunes. Perfect. Yes, that's how I got it. <laughs> that's exactly oh, how I got it. Okay. It's a great way of doing or that. Or on my own website. Remember? Theviahona.com. <laughs> Right, and now are right. you going to release a bigger version of it? Are you going to release it to, I mean, because yes, it's... Yes, that's what we're working on now. In fact, uh, Zaviera has uh, been uh, distributing the extended version uh, for the Europeans. We're working on having the American uh, or North American market covered next. We just really completed that last phase of it. 
Oh, okay, that's wonderful. With a yeah, lot yeah. of extras. Oh, tell, them, tell them the real title of the film, because that's never really meant it. What is the real Zombier title of the film? Hollander, the Happy Hooker, Portrait of a Sexual Revolutionary. And it's on There iTunes. we go. Thanks no, for letting a, us plug it. <laughs> yes, okay. it's, an, it's an excellent documentary. And, 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 I, and it was uh, under an hour, but it I wanted more. I wanted a lot more, so I'm glad you're Well, now you can. It. <laughs> That's That's devil whammy. Robert, real quick, what is your website? It's uh, uh, R.E.D. Productions, which is www.redprods, uh, R-E-D-P-R-O-D-S dot com. And we have the exclusive, uh, the happy hooker documentary dot com. All right. One perfect. word, the happy hooker documentary dot com. Perfect. I want to thank both of you so much for, for spending so much time with, with me and, and Jeff and doing this interview, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. My All right. pleasure. All right. Bye-bye, right. guys. Thank you. Right. Best of luck. Thank you.